Welcome to Frontiers of Innovation. I'm Etna Trainer, your host for this session, and we're absolutely delighted to welcome you here on behalf of Canon Middle East. Canon has put together this very creative series, Frontiers of Innovation, to bring you up to date with what's going on and also in terms of how digitalization is impacting everything that you do, indeed impacting all of our lives. So in the coming weeks, of course, we're going to be with you right throughout the summer, and we're going to bring you up to date, and we're going to look at education and culture and security. Indeed, that's where we're at today. So just have a think about how have you been in the last few weeks? How have you adapted to what's been going on? And I know we've all had to learn very, very quickly in terms of what we've had to do. But how comfortable have you been? And have you ever thought about just how safe the whole system is? Well, that's what we're going to talk about today. So let me guess right down to it now because we have with us here the director of information security for canon europe africa middle east really looking at that wide expanse quinton taylor himself is here quinton i'm absolutely thrilled you're with us thank you so much no thank you it's uh, great to be here and of course i mean you know i look at your background and we look at your engagement on youtube all of the time here and it's almost like you i should say you should have your own show but you do have your own show you're looking at it out there on security insights so when we look at what's been happening, particularly in the last few weeks, and I mean, a lot of people have had to become very, very comfortable with the systems as well. Talk to us really, you know, what do we really need to be mindful for? Because we're now maybe getting used to it, but, but are we getting used to it? And what should we be perhaps aware of still? Well, I think we need to be aware of our personal security or the security of our data, because now we've gone from the situation where everyone's in the office. And so there's a basic security layer that comes as being part of the office to everyone now being at home. So you've got the other aspect, which could be people, for example, printing at home, which is not a problem. But the printing device may be one that is shared with the children doing their homework. Now, imagine the stories from years and years and years ago where people before Follow Me Printing used to... Um, accidentally print two customer letters and someone would pick up one and, and take it to, and send it to the wrong place. And now you've got a situation where your child, you might print something confidential, your child could print it at the same time, grab it, and the next thing you know, a page of your confidential document just got handed in with your child's homework. Well, that's something, yeah, you know, God forbid, we don't want that to happen because you never know who's hanging out, uh, particularly at, uh, at sort of virtual schools these days. You certainly you know, but I really do. I'm, I'm not making light yeah. of it. Serious no, 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 no. I mean, I haven't seen that happen. But I would imagine that um, people doing what's called dumpster diving or bin diving, if you've got someone you know is working from home and you know they're a target, I wouldn't be surprised if certain actors, and I remember, this is not going to be a common thing. This is going to be very, very, very rare. Uh, but I could imagine that if they know you're working from home and they want to get information, then grabbing your bins and grabbing your recycling bins for the paper you may have printed that didn't come out right may be very useful. But that's just one of the little aspects that we've got from working from home. Well, indeed, exactly. And so if anybody knows the, the, the sort of CEOs, the members of the CIA, whoever they are, where they live, and the neighbors might know that, uh, yeah, it's probably a good time to be out there, as you say, in the bins. Let's hope people are not doing that. But this is also a warning for them to make sure that uh, if they do have to print something, there's a shredder in place. If any time we've needed it, it's probably this. But come and you can't, to Well, also, you can't get hold of shredders. Things mm -hmm. like uh, webcams and microphones, shredders, uh, studio lights, you try and buy anything that allows this stuff to happen. And if you didn't have it before lockdown, I'm just waiting for all the stops, the shops to restock. It's very hard to get hold of things here. Indeed, I think when they're planning new homes in the future, there's going to be X amount of bedrooms, living rooms, da da da, and the TV and studio. This uh, is yes, I, I, I think an office is going to be an absolute uh, minimum. I mean, I'm I'm actually just about next month. I'm building one in the uh, uh, in the uh, in the back garden. And if you could see above me here, there was a big hole in the ceiling as I've got a 30 amp cable going that way. And then out that way for my uh, for my office. 
Well, let's hope it's not going to rain in the UK right now while we're on this, you know, just hold on the ceiling. Come back to, again, what should people be aware of here? Because we're looking at, you know, and when everybody started on Zoom and when they started on all of these platforms, you know, we saw the media headlines going, oh, it's insecure, they're taking your information, all of this stuff, what are you going to do? And there was a little bit of fear mongering there. Just give me your very professional opinion on just, you know, how bad is it out there? I think it's, I think we need to balance up the two risks. The risk of someone compromising your data and the risk of your company not existing. And I think the whole thing, especially around things like Zoom, there was a lot of people who were pushing in a lot of fear, uncertainty and dismay around Zoom, which, I mean, I, I, I'm not a great Zoom fan. We used to doing this call on Zoom, but in reality, a lot of these products have got a lot better because they've had to get a lot better. But was there any real risk? Yes, there was risk, but was it greater than the risk of not being able to collaborate and not be able to communicate? I would say no. And I think that's a very valid point when you think about it. I mean, we haven't really heard about too many people's identity been totally compromised. We haven't heard about um, any, you know, virtual takeover of anybody's home, anybody's bank account. I have been uh, the, could I say, victim of a little Zoom bombing once and uh, we were with a group of rather conservative ladies to which somebody just said, look away, ladies, now look away at this point. But it was a little minor inconvenience, but we got over it. But have you heard of any sort of infringements of people's security, like on a serious note? Yeah, well, the thing with Zoom bombing is um, for a group of ladies who are ladies of the world, it probably wasn't a huge issue. Uh, but I have heard, for example, in certain schools, uh, I think it was in Spain, where suddenly the children all got exposed to something rather objectionable. And that, and that could be problematic, which is not the kids will, well, it, it's a problem. Um, but it's what also is concerning is if you're having a conversation that you think is confidential, but it then turns out it's not. But then I also bring you back to a story which happened a few years ago with the French defense minister. And what someone was doing was they were um, trying to pretend to be the French defense minister and they would use the rubber mask and they would contact someone, normally somebody very senior in a company and say, we're the French government, you can talk to the French defense minister. We've got a, um, a French citizen who is in, uh, uh, it has been taken by terrorists. We need you to pay a terrorist ransom. And if you can pay the terrorist ransom, then you know what, French citizenship, maybe you learn now, this will all be yours. Uh, and this person managed to, to take several people for uh, tens of millions. Now, the reason why I say that, so that was a guy using a fake rubber mask and, and Skype with a very poor video quality. You couldn't quite work it out. Well, with modern deep fakes, it would mean that you could then just remap one face over. And if you play with Snap Camera, which is a free utility, you can very easily map one face onto another face. And you know what? If you're not in HD like I am, if you're in standard definition, it can be quite uh, convincing. And I wonder when we're gonna to start to see that where you think you're talking to your colleague or someone calls up and says, hey, um, especially with business email compromise, which is where someone takes over an email address and pretends to be somebody else, um, it could be really, really devastating to a company. Talk to us a little bit about just um, sort of bandit country out there and you know the, the hackers that are in place and what are they doing and why are they doing? And also, you know, at a time like this, I mean, I suppose in many ways, it's it's a bit of a gift to them because they've always been around. And then we hear when some of them, you know, turn state's evidence, so to speak, and become ethical hackers, they tell us about some of the dreadful things they did. And, um, you know, we it's, it's almost unbelievable. But, you know, what is it there? I mean, have, have people nothing else to do? Or are they basically out there really looking, you know, to make monetary gain out of this? Well, I'm afraid to say, but uh, the cybercrime industry is worth billions of, of dollars. So there's a huge amount of money. I mean, uh, one of the big uh, criminal gangs was uh, reckoned to be still making well over $100 million a month on ransomware. So when you start to take that, even with their overheads and even with some other bits and pieces, that's serious business. That's serious money there. Um, and we have seen in, in certain areas, we've seen physical crime start to drop, but online crime go in to replace it. And in one way, that's, I don't know if that's better or worse, probably better, to be honest, because you can insure against the online crime, whereas the physical crime, it going down. I mean, to give you a good example of this, in London, we used to have the Sweeney, the flying squad, who were put in because at the time, bank robberies in the 60s and 70s were, were, were really a big problem. People used to drive in and go in with a gun, uh, sock over their head and go, give me, give you all your money. Whereas that doesn't tend to happen anymore. And the reason why it doesn't tend to happen is because of better physical controls, but also how far can you get with large amounts of money? And if you think about some of the online thefts that we've seen, which have involved hundreds of millions of, of, of dollars, um, 
it's very, very hard to put hundreds of millions of dollars on your back. It's very, very hard to physically move with that volume of money. So the online thefts are much more effective and efficient if you're a criminal. But also when we think about, you know, the sophistication of online, surely you would imagine the traceability at this point should be easier. Or are they even one step ahead of us that they've actually got that one cracked as well? Well, some of the areas where people could hide, I mean, you may have heard about the dark web. You may have heard about Tor, the onion route of the dark web. But a lot of people don't understand where Tor came from. Actually, Tor came from the U.S. military. Uh, it came from the U.S. Navy. They developed it. They created it because they wanted a way for spies to be able to talk to other spies. Um, now, having spies talk to other spies when it's only the spies using this protocol isn't any good because the instant you see Tor in your network, you go, well, uh, somewhere in my network here, there's two spies talking. So what do they do? They released it to the world and that is being used for good and being used for bad. So now the ability to commit your crime transnationally, if you go back to like the 1970s, the only way you could do truly transnational crime was to send someone a letter and say, hey, please, like Nigerian 419 emails used to be Nigerian 419 letters. In fact, these kind of scams go back all the way back to the Middle Ages and go back with the Knights Templar and we've We've uh, we've uh, uh, we've taken your knight, and if you pay lots of money, we won't release him. And then the guy turns up back home several years later, and they go, "Well, we paid your ransom." And he goes, "What ransom? I wasn't captured." And that's exactly the same as a four one nine email, but that was from like ten, twelve something. Um, now, one to the modern day, it's just email. But what it does allow you to do, whilst the online area allows you to contact and reach out and touch all of your customers immediately, it also allows criminals and attackers to reach out and touch your people all twenty four seven as well. So there's swings and roundabouts here. Now, of course, a company like Canon and many of the bigger players around the world, you know, have the luxury of having somebody like yourself who really knows what's going on, has that depth of experience coming from the IT side, coming from the marketing side, coming from, I mean, you, you come from almost every side and you bring such a wealth of knowledge to this. But how about the, the smaller business? Let, let's kind of go with the medium sized business. This is probably something they hadn't anticipated, whereby they really have to get all their people, you know, ready to be working from home in the last few months here. What can companies like, you know, that mid-size, what can they do? Well, actually, fact, I think a lot of the mid-size companies were probably in a better position than some of the larger companies because the mid-size companies probably had already adopted cloud. Cloud's really where it's at. You want to make sure that at least your collaboration tools, your email, your document sharing is in the cloud. And when this whole incident happened, um, it really, really seemed to me when I talked to my friends that there were the people who had their, their collaboration suite in the cloud and then there were problems, there were people who were trying to get it into the cloud as fast as they humanly could. And I talked to a friend of mine who's in a large engineering firm, and because of what they do, they were all on premise because of data confidentiality. And then suddenly it was like, yeah, you know our, our 0365 project? Well, it's, it, it started yesterday afternoon and will be continuing this week 24 7 until we've completed it. And that was just because they had to, they had to have people working from home. Indeed, and I think that's what everybody is faced with right now. But let's bring it down to basics in terms of everybody is at home. I'm sure a few people might have uh, some stories to share with us, and I'd be very happy that our audience gets involved, sends us questions. Maybe uh, if anybody is going to have the answer, Quentin, you're going to be you're going to have it, and if not, you're going to know somebody who certainly exactly, will have yeah. it. So we can we can take those questions, of course, and Quentin will do what he can to make sure you've got an answer. But let's go down to like really basics. What should I be, if I'm on my computer, watching out for? What could possibly be coming at me? You look at, you know, the amount of emails everybody got about COVID-19, and some of them, of course, looking very legitimate that you'd want to open it up because perhaps it was a, another warning. And again, the concept of creating, you know, almost digital twin sites to look like something else. So what could I do in terms of almost arming myself at home to think, uh-uh, before I open that? I think the main two things I would say, just two really basic things, is make sure that you've got two-factor authentication on anything critical. And when I say anything critical, I'm not just talking about your corporate email, which you may have been forced to put two-factor authentication onto. I'm also talking about your personal social media, your LinkedIn, your Facebook, your um, whatever else you're using, your Instagram, whatever else. Make sure you've got two-factor authentication enabled on those. And the other thing is make sure your browser and your PC are patched. If you can do those two things, you will not be able to defend against a uh, determined attacker, but you'll just get rid of a lot of the easy, that the volume of attacks will drop dramatically for you. And I suppose at this time when people are feeling perhaps a bit fearful and almost probably a bit vulnerable, they might be inclined to actually just click on something, particularly if it looks like it could be of 
maybe useful information. That's also yes. something to watch out, I guess. Yeah, so we tell people to stop and think. If something's trying to make you feel emotional, a lot of the attackers, especially with uh, with phishing emails, the one thing they're trying to get out of you is they're trying to elicit an emotional response. So if you're reading an email and it's eliciting an emotional response, that could be something we want to stop and think and say, actually, is this really what I think it is or is it not what I think it is? When we look at, I think I've spoken about this at many conferences as well over the years, you know, that it is, it's almost the most vulnerable that uh, that is targeted. You know, they're not necessarily targeting the CEO. They're probably targeting and they watch. This is what I'm hearing that it's where we're often been observed in terms of if any of the, the, the hackers out there can get a, a focus on what we're doing. They keep an eye, could be on the receptionist, but now we don't know who the receptionist is because everybody's at home. But again, you know, they identify perhaps somebody and from there move in. And once that's in that, I mean, can it really just move on to the network that quick? Yes, it can. I mean, it could just be somebody clicking on something in an attachment that then allows the attacker to take over their PC. And then from there, they can then what's called uh, they can transition. They can move laterally to somebody else's machine and try and get hold of somebody else's area. But what are the laws around this? And they must have changed in the last few years, because some of it, you know, sounds like maybe, um, you know, not quite fun, but it's just disruption and it's inconvenient. But again, as you say, you know, when you look at the criminal business that's going on there. It's almost a new form of organized crime, but has our, oh, it is. System, yes. you know, on both <clears throat> sides, I think there's probably both sides. Has the legal system kept up with this? Uh, no, generally not. The, the major problem with a lot of you know, online crime is it's transnational. So in the past, if someone were to put an advert in the local free ads paper and say, uh, I've got A for sale, please send me 500 pounds. And they didn't have A and you, they just basically received 500 pounds. You'd contact your local police force and they would arrest the person or whatever else. Now you've got the situation with for relatively small amounts of money, it's happening transnationally. So the person will be doing this particular crime from a third party country where there isn't any law in place that may prohibit it. So you see certain areas of the world starting to become specialized in certain kinds of crime where that particular, in inverted commas, crime over here is not a crime or not an arrestable offense over there. So again, I think we have to look at, you know, profiling almost the criminal who's out there. And indeed, uh, not too long ago in, in uh, Abu Dhabi at a big conference, there was one of the, um, a, a good a hacker, a turned hacker, so to speak, telling us like some of the things that he would do. And, uh, you know, he would, he would actually almost upset the neighbors. When he was young, he used to say that he would upset the neighbor's IT system the way then that they would call his house because they knew that he was good at IT and then they bring him in to fix his system and they'd pay him something. So he kind of had a bit of, it started off with a little bit of fun like that. And then obviously it uh, developed into a lot more until uh, it got a little out of hand. And I think the police in the UK had words with him and uh, he turned sort of state's evidence or whatever one does to give away his sort of secret there. But he's he's on the good side now. But can well, a story that came up, well, a story that came up uh, the other day, which actually, it takes a lot to shock me, but I really was truly shocked when I read the story. And this is in the papers, and it's about eBay. And it turns out that some senior executives in the security team of eBay were targeting some people who were writing blogs critical of eBay, um, and they've just been indicted for uh, cyber stalking and harassment and various other things. And this is a really, really serious, I mean, I, I think this is incredibly rare. I've never heard of this happening on this scale before. But it really, really does demonstrate what's called a white knight uh, um, strategy, which is where you target someone exactly like that gentleman was doing. You target them, you cause them a lot of problems, and you wait out for, wait for them to reach out to you. And then you go, ah, oh, well, maybe we can help you. And of Got course, it. they now trust you. And that's that's all over the news. If you just have a quick look for for eBay and uh, and uh, um, white knight or the eBay oh. story, it's over the for the last two days. It's been all over all the tech press. So I guess at the moment, I mean, the main advice to anybody is when you're out there, just be cautious. If you if you have no business, you know, going anywhere and, and responding to anything like that, just stay away from it, I guess. Absolutely. I mean, it's, remember that even though we're mentioning certain stories, though they are incredibly rare stories, they're the ones that like that's never happened ever before. Um, but yeah, the, the real common garden attacks, things like the holiday scams, these happen a lot in, in Western Europe. And it's really simple. You simply go onto a holiday website, a lettings website, and you rent out a property that you don't own. So you simply say, 
hey, do you want to pay a deposit of a thousand pounds to rent out this little cottage on a lake in Lake Como? Lots of people pay you the thousand pounds. You don't even own a property in Lake Como and you just take the money straight off. Really, really simple attack, really, really easy to execute, and it's really common. And indeed, that has happened here in the UAE as well. We are coming to you from Dubai here at the moment, but certainly I've read about that and um, it managed to. I mean, I think here the police have put a lot of focus and attention on their cyber security team. They managed mm -hmm. to track them down. But uh, yes, and a lot of people, you know, it sounded, I think particularly when everybody was being quite mobile, you know, under COVID-19 and people needed maybe short-term laps. So it's really, it's, it's very sad too that this would happen at a time like this. Never mind, we're getting questions in. I'm absolutely delighted here. And I do know we've got such a wide reach on this LinkedIn Live. So we're really happy about this here. Kuno from Nigeria joins us here. And again, interestingly enough, he says, you know, e-commerce platforms should, um, you know, and companies should probably invest more in cybersecurity. Again, it's probably one of those things when it's on the list and they're looking at the OPEX budget and thinking, well, should we, shouldn't we? We've been safe so far, but is it a matter of, you know, not if, but when people might be targeted? So it's, abs would you say it's essential? I would say it's absolutely essential. I'd say there are two kinds of companies. There are companies that have been hacked and companies that don't yet know that they've been hacked. To a certain degree that almost every single company you speak to, and it's one of the questions we ask new suppliers, we say, can you talk to us about a recent security incident and the companies that say we've not had any, we we move away from at high speed because it's natural to have security incidents. You cannot stop everything. And it's this whole thing of this castle mentality. You don't have a castle mentality. What you have is you just have a way of saying, I will try and slow them down, make it inconvenient, and I'll be, improve my resources so that I can recover. So that resilience rather than just totally protecting yourself. Now, I have another question from IN Dubai, and of course, while companies might be investing and they have to do it and it has to be part of their OPEX, what about, you know, IA at home in Dubai here and really looking at techniques or tools um, that can actually help people, individuals, stay safe while they're at home? What would you recommend there? And when it comes to, you know, are we looking at Apple? Are we looking at what platform, you know, is one safer than the other? You know, some people, I think, have a sense of, you know, maybe a false sense of security that we're fine, that everything is in place. Talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah. So actually, any of the platforms can be risky and any of the platforms can be secure. Um, not one is more secure or less secure than the other. And the same advice comes in, which is make sure you've got your, your multi-factor authentication in place for the, the accounts that are critical and make sure that you've also got um, uh, your patches and everything up to date. Make sure your Wi-Fi network is actually properly locked down. Really and truly, just make sure you've, you've set a proper password, you're updating all of your equipment, and make sure, for example, your home router. We, I don't know what it's like over in the UAE, but where people have default passwords on their home routers, and it's like, no, no, just make sure that you don't have the manufacturer default. If you go to log on to your home router and you're logging in with admin, admin, or or manufacturer name, manufacturer name, or if the manufacturer name is the password, or you can Google for the password for your router, you might want to change that and set it to something that's just a little bit more complicated and unique to you. And the other thing to remember, with, sorry, sorry, the last bit of advice I have, apart from two-factor authentication, is also use a password manager. It is not important to have a massively complicated password, but it is important to not ever share a password between websites. If you share a password on one website and that website gets compromised, the attackers will potentially take that password and they'll try it on everything else. Wow, now that's interesting to know. And come back to this password manager. Um, forgive my ignorance on this one. And you've just put uh, you know, a little bit of fear in me too because I've just got a new router and um, I'm not sure it's, it's just working. I, I don't know how it's, it's just, it's on. So I'm going to have to double check that one now and see how do I sign into it or things like that. Uh, forgive me on that, uh, but um, I'm getting a lesson in home security from you as well as everything else. <laughs> Talk to me about the concept of a password manager. What is that? So a password manager is just a piece of software or an online service that might be linked to a piece of software that simply stores your usernames and your passwords for uh, websites and for applications. And you will authenticate to that password manager with either some kind of um, key, some kind of USB key, or a passphrase, or Windows Hello, or the Apple Mac equivalent, or anything else. So you remember one password, one passphrase, quite long, because you're not going to change that that often. And then what you then do is when you've authenticated to it, 
it can then authenticate you to further things. And it means that you don't need to remember hundreds of passwords because that's the reason why people set the same password on everything. And that can be an absolute devastating piece when one site gets compromised and suddenly everything else that you share the same password, because remember it's the same username, because it's going to be your email address. And if you've ever reused that same password, they'll just take out everything they possibly can. It's called password spraying. If you no, want to ever know if your account's ever been a compromised, if you have a quick Google for a website called uh, Have I Been Pawned, it's a one run by um, Troy Hunt over in Australia, and it's Have I Been, and it's P-A-W-N-E-D, which was a hacker leak speak for, for owned, for compromised. Um, it's a totally safe website to put your, 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 well, you wouldn't put your password in there, but you put your username in there, your email address in there, and then it'll tell you which breaches in the last five to 10 years, your email address has been involved in. Now, if you put an email address in there and it hasn't been involved in a breach, congratulations, but that's rare. Normally you've been involved in at least one, maybe more. And you can then say, now that breach, did what password do I use for that site? Did I use that anywhere else? Because if I did, I need to go and change it. And we've got examples, for example, of like LinkedIn. LinkedIn's a great example. They were compromised back in 2010, didn't really tell, didn't tell everybody the true scope of it till 2012. And the attackers got hold of the underlying password. Now, everyone reused their LinkedIn password with a lot of other very important sites because LinkedIn's very important. And this then became almost a gift that kept giving for attackers because they used that underlying password database because no one knew it had been taken for years. I even saw of a major, um, a major security company's website that was defaced. And it then turned out that someone who worked for the company who, who put the website together had not changed their LinkedIn password, the attacker knew that this person had right permissions on their website and changed it and went straight from there. And that was embarrassing, nothing serious, but all because of the fact that a password hadn't been changed. In actual fact, another one, a major hacker turned good guy had his Twitter account compromised because he himself forgot that he'd shared the same password on his LinkedIn as he did on his Twitter. That was, that was quite amusing because I saw that unfold in real time and it was like, Really, Kevin, I can't. And he was also very embarrassed. He was mortified oh. that that had happened. Gosh, you're making me very nervous now. And I'm going to have to check out on all of this. So that but these are simple is, things. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Have I been pawned? So I think yeah. everybody will probably be checking on that just to see. But again, it's, it's so important that we keep an eye on that. We have a few more questions in here. And John from Kenya actually talking about is being connected to a VPN. Does that increase the chances of actually hacking? Is there an increase, decrease? Talk well, to so us a about. VPN or virtual private network should decrease the chances yeah, of security issues on the local network. So depending on what VPN provider you're using, where you're coming in from, that VPN provider should remove any issues around the local network. Say, for example, if you're sitting in a coffee shop, the, the coffee shop network, or you're sitting in a hotel, because especially depending on where you go into, some hotels, and we saw this with... Um, um, I can't remember the North Korean, there was a North Korean government group called Dark Something Group, and they specialized in checking into hotels that they knew very important people that North Korea wanted to hack were checking into, and they'd sit there on the internal Wi-Fi network or the internal hotel network, scanning for the guests, and when you connected in, they would try and take over your PC. Whoa, okay, so I'm gonna be a lot more aware when I'm out there, if nothing else on that. But um, so interesting on the VPN, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's about buyer beware, basically, I think. Yeah, VPNs are generally great, Buy one from a major manufacturer, from a, from a major place, and just remember, they're not a panacea, but they will remove a lot of the local issues. Say, for example, you have to connect to a, a hotel or, wi or a coffee shop Wi-Fi that you're not entirely sure about, that may have hostile people sitting on it. Now, I have a few questions here. Um, Ahmed from Egypt and indeed Sylvester from the Ivory Coast, and both of them wanting to know how a printer can be you know, uh, sort of a, a device that could be threatened. And the first time you mentioned this to me, I'm thinking, how on earth? It's just my printer. What on earth are you talking about? So how well, can you make sure printers are secure? It's, it's a few people have asked this one. It depends on the style of printer, but a printer is just a computer on your network. It has memory, it has storage of some description. It has a network interface, may have Wi-Fi, may have ethernet as well. And you also send very, very sensitive data to it. And a modern printer can scan to everything from Google Drive, Dropbox, Microsoft, SharePoint, the whole enchilada. So if it can scan to there and retrieve documents to print from there, it's got to have logon credentials to those locations as well. So it's essentially just another computer sitting on your network. And the same advice goes to how you secure a computer in your network. 
Make sure that you've applied some kind of hardening guide to it. You've turned off the services you don't need. You've configured it in the right way. And make sure you've patched and updated it and make sure the password isn't default. If you do those three things, you're a lot further along than everyone else is. Do you think some people are, you know, just naturally sort of lazy about these things? Or are we just possibly like me at the moment, maybe just a little bit careless? I just... Um, or, or we just hiding, we're in denial, maybe we're just not paying enough attention. And as you said, possibly everybody out there has been hacked at some point, even if it hasn't been a major um, offense, you know, but it has probably happened. What, what, what's the problem with all of us, you know, individuals out there that we're not perhaps on top of this, if it's still going on and it's going on with such frequency? It's complexity. I will be really honest to you, setting up a password manager, setting up uh, your updates, changing the password on your router, all of these things, they are complicated and they are challenging. Um, and we're very much used to, if you remember old style cars, I remember on my first car doing an oil change myself. Now, when I pop open my bonnet, there's a big bit of plastic cowling that says, don't lift this, contact an authorized service center. I have, I have looked underneath, but I, I let them do the stuff. It's all under their business. And that's the difference. So we're very much used to that. We don't dig into the details anymore. And obviously, and the problem with a lot of the online stuff is we've got to log on for details. We've got to start saying, who does this impact? If my router gets hacked, I could blame my ISP. I could do all this. But at the end of the day, I'm the one that cares. So I need to take some accountability. Saying, How am I going to get this fixed? But manufacturers also have a, uh, have a, um, a responsibility to try and provide secure kit. But the other thing as well is, buy kit from manufacturers who you think are supporting your security. Because only if you vote with your feet and your wallets will manufacturers start to say, across the whole, the whole arena, start to say, security is one of the reasons why people buy our products, therefore we want to make our products more secure. It's a vicious cycle. If you buy products because they're cheap or they look shiny or whatever else, and not because of security, it's then very hard to then start to say, ah, but why are the manufacturers not doing it? Well, they're not doing it because you're not voting with your feet. I was actually going to just ask you that because I think, I mean, we have, we see this in all sectors, in all areas when it comes to prison, pretty much all consumer goods, the fake market that's out there. And just wondering, is there such a thing as a fake market in security services? <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. there is actually. Yeah, yeah. No, uh, it's quite rare. So there was a really, really great one that came to the fore a couple of years ago, and they just arrested somebody else from the group. There was a criminal group who was called Fin7, who was a, uh, a ransomware group. Uh, underneath. Uh, and you can Google for Fin7 ransomware group and you'll get the whole sordid tale, including the indictment. It's worth reading. The US, the US Department of Justice indictments are absolutely awesome reads on occasion. Um, and this particular group was setting themselves up as an information security company. Um, but they would, their information security company was just a front. They didn't have any real paying customers. They had victims. Um, so what they were using it for was to appear legitimate and to pay people and to launder money. Uh, and to be able to recruit the best and the brightest. And so they were going on, and, and this group is probably one of the highest earning uh, ransomware groups that ever existed. And slowly the US Department of Justice is going on, and they've just, they've just managed to arrest the old IT administrator, who apparently, if you read the indictment, when he first started working for them, he thought he was going for a legitimate system administration job, but then rather swiftly afterwards would have been very clear that he was working for a criminal organization. So that just shows that you do get fake companies. There was a really wonderful case of a um, in one of the Eastern European countries of a fake antivirus company. And most of the people who worked there thought that they were working for a real anti-malware company, but they weren't. They were working for a criminal organization that was just selling anti-malware and stealing data. Wow, I mean, I, just, I, I love your stories because they really are the ones that you actually think uh, are almost science fiction up there. And, uh, there's probably loads more out there, but it's uh, this is all what's happening. And this is all stuff that we really need to be a bit more aware of. And I guess a little bit more conscious and a bit more skeptical in terms of when things just appear, if they appear not maybe 100% correct, then chances are they're not. I mean, I think there's probably a bit of common sense that has to be introduced to this as well, would you say? Yeah, exactly. If something seems too good to be true, it probably is. Um, if someone if someone just reaches out out of the blue and starts to offer you a wonderful business opportunity and you're not expecting it, it I'm not saying it is a, a scam, but start turning your spider sense on. Just put your, your scam radar on and start having a listen around because most of the times it probably is a scam and it's your intuition. And the number of times we talk to people being caught out by malware or caught out by a decent phishing email and they go, well, I kind of had a bit of doubt. But also, let's be very honest here. 
with the scammers, this is their job. If they do not fool you, they don't get, they don't, they don't eat. They don't get paid and they don't eat. So the ones who are bad at scamming don't get paid and don't eat and therefore probably stop scamming. So by the time they get to you, they're good. They're really good. So don't beat yourself up too much if you get caught up. And I guess that's the worry too, because they are good and they're getting better. And there are a lot of companies that are out there that are almost the cybersecurity police. Um, talk to us perhaps a little bit about that, because that's become a huge business. And also, I believe there's almost a network that they do share sort of best practices, so to speak, their competition out there, but they share, I think, in within the industry, they become an industry group to share what's going on within the industry. Oh, and yeah, yeah, there are, yeah, there are many industry forums that typically work with uh, law enforcement. So Europol has a really, really big group where they work. And if you go onto a website called uh, nomoransomware.org, it's a really, really good website. Um, and it's uh, run by a, um, a couple of friends of mine. Um, and they have decided to take the position that they're going to pool all the information that they have on various ransomware families and provide it to people free of charge, obviously, to say, if you get hit by ransomware, if we work out how to decrypt that ransomware, you here can download what you need to do. So if you do get hit by ransomware, go to go. nomoransomware.org. Go and have a look. You never know. You might be lucky. There may already be a key. You may be able to get some, you'll get good advice on there as to what you need to do. And that's run with some people from antivirus companies, some people from law enforcement, some other industry luminaries to put this site together and say, look, people, ransomware shouldn't exist. And with their help, it won't be. No, and I think that's great. And it's great to see the industry, a competitive industry, come together for basically, I think, the protection of people who are out there. And I suppose it gives us some sense of comfort uh, that uh, we, we can all beat this because it sounds a lot worse actually than I started this phone call. By the time I finish it, I am going to be you know, very afraid. And, and I should be, I think is what you're saying too. Uh, Mohammed from Jordan's coming in here. He's actually saying, should the data center or the cloud be in the country, obviously the country of, I guess, operation um, to decrease the chance of threatening the data or does it matter? So where should your, where, where, where is the cloud? Well, the cloud is just somebody else's computer. And in real cloud, it doesn't really matter where it is. I think it depends upon your local laws and who your threat actors are. If you're worried about governments accessing your data, then you may be concerned about which physical location your data's in. If the government isn't one of your threat actors, then in reality, you want your data in the place that is closest to your customers or the most geographically available or whatever else. Um, and I know there's a lot of some of the like local laws in some of the European countries where they say certain data types can't leave certain countries. I know that's the same in the Middle East, where they'll say certain data of certain citizens must be resident in this country. Personally speaking, I don't think it really matters an awful lot, but of course you must comply with your local legislation. Now, you know, a lot of people pay obviously some attention to this, think we must look at it, uh, but you also have to look at now the amount of people who everybody is on devices. Look at, I mean, I, I wouldn't want to ask how many are in your house, you know, and you've got uh, younger children as well that uh, probably have a few. And again, you know, look at different information, probably not on the one. I might look at my phone, I might look at another, at an iPad or something like that. But how many devices and how safe are they? And that whole concept of, and everybody knows how to work it. I mean, I think, you know, even smaller children, it's the one thing they seem to learn really quickly nowadays. So what's the danger there? Because some people are good, some people are very aware, and then other people think it's, you know, a toy in many ways. Yeah, the first thing I would do is say with, with children is if you allow them to browse the internet unsupervised is have a very adult conversation with them. My daughter came to speak to us a few months ago and said, hey, I've got the subscriber to one of my channels and, and, and I'm on their Discord and I'm just not happy with the way they're talking to me. And I could, well, I did. I gave her a big hug. We looked through it and we went, okay, so that person there isn't saying anything bad, but definitely that was leading in a direction that she wasn't feeling comfortable with. And quite frankly, neither was I. So having that open conversation with your children to say, look, I can't prevent you from accessing bad stuff. I can't stop bad stuff from appearing on your screen, but I can try and make you resilient. I can try and make it so that if that does happen, you understand what you need to be able to do. And again, I mean, where does that responsibility lie? And we look at all the kids who are homeschooled right now. And also, I think, you know, we're looking at computer classes in school. Is there enough been done? And is this and should it be perhaps more part of the curriculum in school in terms of okay, creating awareness 
but also making sure that I suppose kids at a younger age are you know pre-armed because now they're 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 digital savvy. So it's not as if we're giving them too much information about this. They know what they need to do. But is that actually happening? And are you seeing and are you encouraged that the educational system around the world is beginning to look at this as something very serious and something on the curriculum? Absolutely. I, we can we can see that it's there's a, a huge amount going on with the schools to try and um, enable the children to understand how to defend themselves and to understand that not everybody online is actually um, uh, is is friendly. Um, but we've also got to remember that that a lot of the risks, whilst they are very very serious risks, if you take appropriate uh, measures and you talk to your children and you you talk about what they're doing and you take an interest in what they're doing, you hopefully can pick these things up before they become a massive problem. Now we look at all of these platforms that are in place and many of them were in place, of course, before the lockdown with COVID-19. Um, and, and I often think of Malcolm Gladwell's book, Outliers. I think he needs to rewrite it actually, because <laughs> this example is, I think certainly kind of one of that. You know, you look at the Zooms of the world, you look at that, all of these services and platforms seem to have, you know, the initial entry level, which is free. And that's probably good enough for mom and pop and the cousins to play their quiz on and all of that stuff. But then there are layers of security coming up here. And let's particularly look at, I think, the Zoom case, because a lot of that has been talked about, mm. too. I mean, I suppose it has created connectivity around the world. And, you know, nobody can deny that. And I think the millions, and we, we really, I, I, I don't have my numbers, but I'm sure there are how many millions of people are probably at this very minute going through some platform right now, talking to, connecting with people. But, you know, what, what's, what would you advise? Okay, here's, let's, let's just look at the basic service, the free level. It's doing what it does. Are people comfortable with that? Should they be happy with that? Because this will also probably exist long after COVID-19 is gone. Yeah, I suppose it depends on what you're doing, really. It's try and work out what is the sensitivity of the data you're discussing. So a great example of this was when the whole thing about uh, uh, Zoom first came up. My wife, who also works in IT, came to talk to me and said, Quentin, what are your people... What, what are you people in York basically making me responsible for the whole InfoSec community? What are you doing? And she turned around this what showed this WhatsApp message where people were in her running group were actively talking about whether Zoom was safe enough and secure enough for their running group to discuss. Now, Did just to be really honest, she was just talking about potentially running the Harrow Half Marathon, and she was going, There's nothing confidential in our Zoom conversations. Why are people getting this concern? So in that particular case, people were overblowing the, the risk because that group it made no difference at all however we also had the uk government discussing uh, their secret plans with respect to uh, covid19 and they were using zoom now was that a good idea i don't know the fact they actually put the id up and well maybe potentially that was a huge problem for them um that so you've got to understand what is the risk what is the risk of the data and remember also that a lot of the platforms have increased their security level dramatically since covid19 since the increase in usage and I think we're hearing that from many of them, too. And that is almost one of their big selling points at the moment, because this has become, I think, a hugely competitive space and show it so it should. I mean, I would imagine that even, you know, when we all get back to the office or the half of us that are going back to the office, I would still think that an awful lot of people are actually going to maintain sort of telecommuting. And a colleague of mine, a, an analyst in the yep. energy sector, actually said to me that he's not so much worried about electric cars displacing demand for oil and gas right now for petroleum he's saying that telecommuting might actually have a much bigger impact than we've ever imagined how is how yeah. has that changed well we can actually just see it around here in west london is it 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 feels like well because of course the kids aren't back at school so you've got no morning rush hour you've got no morning rush i mean you could go out for a drive at nine o'clock in the morning and it's just clear traffic all the way straight through in one way i quite like it but the economic impact is obviously concerning but I think this whole thing is we just need to understand that this kind of working from home, this kind of not being in the office five days a week for many people is going to be the new normal. And we need to understand how we're going to cope with that. And from an IT perspective, if you do get malware going through your company or malware comes in from a home network, how do you then swap out all the laptops? How do you re-image? How do you do all of these things? And you've got to be able to cope and work out what are your strategies for being able to have all of your people remote. And if all of your people are remote, do you need to ship them a laptop? Could you use uh, um, some kind of uh, uh, remote terminal service to be able to say, look, bring whatever PC you want, 
and just connect to this terminal and then just come straight in via this, uh, uh, this virtual machine. Yes, indeed, I was going to ask you that because obviously a lot of people have a company laptop and I'm sure you know, half the world is operating on a company laptop, but also you know, there are times they'll have their own and there will be probably a little bit of both going on. And this is something, it's nothing new. We've heard about this when it comes to the higher levels of, of government and you know, mm -hmm. ministers and presidential candidates on a personal one or a, a work one, whatever. But what would you recommend in terms of you know, what machine should people be operating on if they're doing work? And in a way, can you really separate the work machine from the home machine? I would definitely suggest having a separate machine for home and a separate machine for work if the budget allows. Um, I, I was talking to a friend of mine who was saying, well, if you could have it where you do all of your sensitive stuff, your online, uh, your, your banking and whatever else on, on a cheaper machine that you only use for that purpose, and then you do your gaming and whatever else on something else, maybe that's better. I don't do that, to be honest. But what I do do is I make sure that everyone has their own machine in the house. It then means that any kind of compromise occurs on that machine so that I really, really worry when you hear about saying, oh, we have a family computer and the kids use it for gaming and they use it for this and the parents use online banking. And that really does worry me. I appreciate obviously budgets might not stretch to having lots of machines, but at least if you can have it where the stuff that you couldn't recover from is on a machine that's separated from the areas where you know there's going to be a hive of malware and whatever else. And indeed, on that note, we have a, a message in here from Najib in Lebanon. And just to all of you at home, we still have about 15 minutes left. Well, not quite, but uh, we'll have a good 10 minutes left on this. So please, we still have time for a few questions from Quinton. And um, he is, he's a mine of information here. So I think we can just about ask him anything. So Najib is actually talking about online gaming and particularly a threat for you know children maybe, as they said, not data threatened, but culture and bad ideas, and maybe asking mm -hmm. them to do something that might be, you know, not acceptable or dangerous, you know, and how to control it. And you, you told us that story with your own daughter, but again, you've had that conversation with her. And I suppose that's yeah, probably yeah. the first thing you would say to parents as a number one advice. Yeah, to have that conversation and be interested. Um, my, my daughter loves to play Roblox. Well, I've played Roblox as well. So I kind of am aware of what can go on in that particular game. Um, and I'm also aware of, I mean, let's be honest as well, the children are incredibly inventive. So to give you a great example of this, my daughter was sitting on Discord or something talking to her school friends. And I could hear her school friends talking in the background. Anyway, I said, look, you need to finish by three o'clock because you've got some homework to do. So I still had like 10 past three. I wandered past and I went, hey, daughter, is that still your school? Oh, no, we're hanging up, we're hanging up now. And suddenly I heard the, the noise of, of the hang up noise in, uh, in, uh, in the sky patch in the world. Um, as I walked away, I suddenly heard a whispered voice from one of my daughter's best friends going, has he gone? And I turned around and said, sorry, did Tom, your best friend, just play the noise of hang up, but didn't actually hang up? And anyway, the giggles started on the call. And you say, you're nine years old and you've already taught me something new. I didn't think, just play the noise of hang up. And then the parent automatically thinks that everyone's then hung up in the call, whereas that's why they're all still sitting on the call. So, and we wonder why the cyber uh, hackers are, are getting good when you see this coming from your nine-year-old kids. So, uh-oh. Um, I think, yeah. Well, I they're mean, digital online... natives. They, they've only ever lived in this world. Yeah. So they're definitely, they're going to be way ahead of us, way ahead of me, that's for sure. Um, and I have to sort of recruit uh, some of the younger ones to come in and set <laughs> stuff up for me without a doubt. And they do this so well and so quick. And then, then you know, cutely send me a message going, you know, how is it going? Am I managing, you know? <laughs> um, but again, I think the concept of online gaming, I mean, that too, are there, you know, free games out there that will lure kids in? Because clearly, hopefully, they're not going to have access to your credit card. But in the event, it is that family computer. There might be a danger that they could. Yeah, they could actually say to people, uh, could you download this map pack? Because then you can join us on this particular server and you can do this and that and the other you can potentially have an issue with uh, grooming where people are trying to befriend children on some of these games as well. I think the thing to remember is these kind of issues are rare. They do happen, but they are rare. But you can counter them just by being interested, just by, I don't know, if you've got another computer, say, hey, can we game together? Get some, get some parent child time. You never know. You might actually enjoy it. But you can also then sit on the server and start to understand what's going on. Um, and it's about having the said, having an adult conversation with your children to say, look, if someone is there and they're swearing, is that appropriate? Um, I mean, I've even had the situation where my daughter 
chastises me on language if I'm on a conference call with someone from work and she'll go, daddy, language. And he's like, oh, yeah, sorry, I'm just being told by my daughter. to." But this is, this is just about having that conversation with them and just understanding what the risks are. And indeed, I, I mean, I guess when it is, I, and, and this is a great opportunity to do it. I mean, never waste a good crisis, as they say. When it's exactly. brought the family together and really there is a time. Do you think enough people, are you hearing that enough people are actually having these conversations just because it can be, it's, it's going to be the way of the future and we all have to, you know, put in our two cents into it. So is it happening and is it happening? Should everybody listening to this call, if they haven't had those conversations, be having them tonight? I think if you haven't had one, please have it tonight. Sit down with your children and say, so what is it you're doing online? Can you show me? And in a non-judgmental way, ask them to take you through. Take an interest in what they're doing. You never know. You might suddenly pick up a brand new hobby. You might suddenly become the next uh, Minecraft uh, YouTube or Twitch streamer superstar. But on a sensible note, what will happen is you'll then be able to start to talk to your children and understand the world that they're living in. And don't just treat those electronic devices like digital babysitters where you can just hand it to them and they disappear off and be quiet for several hours. Talk to them about what they're doing. And of course, if you are at all worried, why not put the family computer in the living room? Don't have it in the bedroom, have it in the living room so that you say, look, I don't mind you sitting there with a pair of headphones and gaming, but it just means that you can see what's going on and you know what's going on. And, and you could even tell them you missed a bit there. You might want to build that. Like you're going to, that that, that, that structure is never going to work in Minecraft. You're going to have to come in the other way on that one. You could just annoy them that way as well. It's one of life's little pleasures. Now, you must be really encouraged to see the world, you know, coming on board and adapting to all of these issues and looking and, and actually using probably their computers more than they've ever done before. I think there was a lot of resistance and whether we liked it or not, this has just escalated and just moved us. It zoomed us into a position <laughs> Um, you know, where, whether whatever platform we might use, we have to know what's going on. And we, I think everybody knows a little bit about what's happening now. I mean, how encouraged are you that this now is perhaps the start of something else for all people in the world to actually, you know, become more computer literate, probably? I mean, in one way, this current crisis has driven a digital transformation like we've never seen before. And in that way, that is good. It's connected a lot more people together. It's got people to really understand that I can be productive at home. I can work not in the office. Um, but I really, really am, personally speaking, looking forward to at least getting some office time back now again, just so I can sit down with my coworkers. I actually quite like my coworkers. I like to talk to them. I like to interact with them. Uh, and you don't get quite the same kind of level of interaction via the screen. So in one way, I think this has really, really driven a lot of people, especially at all levels of the company, by being forced to work at home. They're now starting to realize that they them, if they themselves can be effective working from home, so can their workers as well. And that's going to really change society, I think, for the better long term. I think it's probably going to have more changes on society right now in the long term than many other reforms that we've done over the over preceding years. And indeed, that's what, uh, you know, for you, people are probably calling you a lot more and sending you messages and say, how do I do this? What's happening here? All of that. But, you know, the connectivity that it has put in place, I think, is, is really good. Do you see this, you know, as a long term situation? And where are the good bits? What do you want to see get better, basically, even with the platforms that are out there? Because if it's here to stay, then it's obviously going to, to change and shift and hopefully get better. Well, it's funny, actually, that uh, a few years ago, we used to draw network diagrams with our office clearly laid out on one side and then some data centers, then the cloud, and then nothing of the other side of that. And now in reality, what's on the other side of that matters more to us than all of this office infrastructure with all our offices connected together. Um, because now we are dependent upon the DSL, the, the local connections, the last mile connections. And that's the same globally. Whereas in the past, if someone chose to work from home and their network connection go, went down, the company was saying, just come into the office. Well, now you, in many cases, you can't come into the office. So we've got to sort out our local connections to make them as, as resilient as we possibly can. And we haven't had, uh, in Western Europe at least, a major DSL, I'm touching wood here just to make sure it doesn't happen, a major DSL outage since this whole crisis has kicked off. So I think some of the underlying telcos need an absolute round of applause for keeping everything running. But the main I things I want to do, yeah. sorry, please. Yeah. No, I think we can see the same here in the Middle East. I mean, it's just, and also I think the fact that the police channels and the police stations have put in place, you know, their cybersecurity people and yep. their... Are they beginning to work and talk more with the industry and talk more with people like yourself in terms of making sure that the safety net is there really for everybody? 
Yeah, so we have a lot more contact with the police. Um, we have a lot more contact with law enforcement. And it's it, those things really are now starting to come together where we're trying to say, actually, everybody's here trying to do the same thing, which is make everyone's online experience as safe and profitable as possible. Um, again, you know, we've got to, you know, make sure that everybody is on board on this. Do you think when we look at what's to happen in the future, this has been in a way, you know, a turning point for a lot of people. I would imagine there's no, there's no going back on this. I can't see people like saying, oh, well, that was, we did Zoom during COVID lockdown, but, um, you know, we're going to, we're going to start writing letters again. That's not going to happen, huh? No, I think this is how it's going to be. I don't think, I don't think we're going to be permanently working from home. As a, as a society, but I think we are going to be a lot more flexible to say, you know what, I'll have my creative days when I come into the office and I sit down and we, we work where we need human to human contact to bounce ideas off each other. And there'll be days where they say, look, I'll get all the paperwork done, I'll get all the policies done, I'll get the procedures done, and I can do that all from home. I don't need to be in the office, which will suddenly mean that you don't need to buy a house near the office if you're only going to come into the office two days a week. So it can even change how, how society, I mean, we talked about houses changing. But it could even be where the houses are might change as well. Yeah, in fact, I was just going to round it up and talk about that briefly with you because this is just part of a series. And the last week we did it, we really looked at, you know, a wider umbrella in terms of how digitalization is impacting everything we do. I think the key area in terms of the security side too, again, impacts everything we do. And it is something that people have to be very conscious about. But we're going to look in the next few weeks, too, we're going to look at education, we're going to look at environment, we're going to look at communication, we're going to look at, at work, at play. Um, you know, so again, I think nothing is, nothing is exempt. Would you encourage everybody to possibly pay a little bit more attention, no matter if it is at home, at work, at school, at play, culture, entertainment, it really needs a bit of a wider umbrella. And we all need to be maybe a bit more responsible. Yes, exactly. And it's just like that thing we talked about, your router password. That's yours. You now know that's well, your responsibility. Let me know if you need any help. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to have to check that one out because I can absolutely positively say right now, I don't have a clue. So, I mean, this has just been fascinating. But once again, just to remind people out there, uh, a few of those websites, sites, remind us again, have I been pawned? Correct? That should, yep. we should be A-W-N-E-D. Yes. We can send this around afterwards, but we can also, so it's Harry Bourne, which is the Troy Hunt website. There was no more ransomware.org. That's a really easy one. Just www.nomoreransomware.org. And I think they were the two main ones. And regarding a password manager, um, I can't really recommend one. There's this KeyPass, which is a free open source one. There's one built into the Chrome web browser. If you're using Apple, you've got Keychain. Um, you know what? They're all as good as each other. Just pick a major one, pick one that you like, and you will enjoy the benefits of not having to remember all your passwords and being able to have different passwords for everything, which means that when one website gets compromised, it doesn't take out the rest of your digital life. Well, well, I've had a personal lesson in security without a doubt on this one, you know, so I'm going to have to thank you even for that, Quentin, because there's quite a lot that uh, 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 I need to uh, be looking into. And I'm sure there's a lot of our viewers out there, too, who are really looking at this and thinking we've got to check all of these areas, too. So it's really been an absolute joy. And for people to catch up with you, because you have just so much going on. As I say, it is the Quentin Taylor channel. If you go over there to Security Insights um, on where we find it on YouTube for Canon. Yeah, Security Insights on YouTube. I have a personal YouTube channel as well, which talks about security, but that's more RFID and more sort of like the, uh, the more of a practical hacking sides of security. Uh, and I'm available on Twitter as Quentin Blog. If you quickly look me up on, on Twitter, I'm on there. That's my semi-corporate account. And I do a lot of stuff on information security and trying to make sure that people become more secure. And indeed it is. It's, it's informative. It's entertaining. It's engaging. I just absolutely love watching you. So you have, and, I, and to know that you come from such a great place, you know, having all that great information and really you're putting it out there to help everybody. We really, really appreciate it. I was just thrilled when I heard that you were going to be coming on here. So thank you so much. So there we had Quentin Taylor, the Director of Information Security from Canon, Europe, Middle East, Africa. So really looking after the big space and keeping us all safe. Quentin, thank you so much. Thank you. And a big thank you to all of you at home. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for your questions. As I said, we're going to be with you right throughout the summer. We have great topics lined up. We're talking to some great people out there, as good as Quentin, um, who are going to share their expertise and their insight and all put in place, you know, in this very innovative, creative space, frontiers of innovation. 
brought to you by Canon, really looking at you know, things that are impacting our world, your world, how in fact we all work together to make it all a much better world for everyone. So next Wednesday, just a quick heads up, we're going to be talking education. So I'm Edna Trainer, and from all of the team at Canon, we're absolutely delighted to have been able to bring you this security, cybersecurity at home, and we'll be getting ready and hoping to join you and hoping you join us next week. Keep well, and in the meantime, stay safe.